Right, so I think we are ready to start. Uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today's session. He is the host of the ABS-CBN News Channel's executive class. Please welcome Mr. David Seldron. Hi, David. Ah, uh, hold on. I think you're on uh, mute. That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's all new to me. I was saying I'm clapping for myself uh, yeah, because usually with a live audience, you can hear people clapping. This is really quite odd and weird. I can't hear anything except my own voice and yours. <laughs> but thank you so much, Thea. This is all part of the new normal. Thank you yeah. for the introduction and thank you for inviting me once again as your host and moderator for the second event of Colors International in the country. I think we showed our viewers a few minutes ago some of the photos and the yeah, slides of what that event looked like. I think that was a couple of years ago. I was the moderator of that event. It was called the Wellness in the Workplace. There you go. No physical distancing, no masks on our faces. <laughs> like so much has changed, right, since the pandemic began. And uh, wow, instead of calling it a seminar, we're now calling it a webinar. But anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm David Saldan, and I'll be your host, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar entitled Life Spaces, the Future of the Workplace. Now, thank goodness for the internet, for broadband, and of course, for apps like Zoom. Um, we were able to push through with this event. Of course, it's very different. I'm not used to doing this online. I'm used to having everyone converging in the same place at the same time. I'm used to seeing your reaction. I'm used to seeing having eye contact with all of you, but I'll do my best to adjust to this new normal. Okay, um, I suspect most of you are joining and participating from your homes. And I understand we have about more than a thousand registered participants. Let's give ourselves a big hand. I can't hear you, but I'll pretend I can hear the clapping. Um, this is huge, this is a big group, more than a thousand. And most of us are joining from our homes. I'm at home right now, this is not a virtual background. But of course, I don't usually wear a coat or a suit at home. Um, so if you decide to join in in your pajamas or in your house clothes, don't worry because none of us can see you. We can't even hear you. As Thea said, we've muted your microphones and we've disabled your camera. So sit back, relax, enjoy this webinar, and hopefully you'll pick up a lot of important insights. Okay? This is all very new to all of us, but so is the way we work and so is the location from where we work now. In fact, I find it quite liberating and exciting. Now, here's why. Some context first. Now, over the past years, we've seen how the workplace has been changing radically, with many companies allowing more flexibility and more emphasis on wellness as part of their business strategy. Now, what the pandemic has done, everyone, is that it has accelerated these workplace trends, turning the once novel work from home arrangements or safety and health protocols in the office into mainstream business practices. Now, practices which and when executed properly have the potential to become a sustainable competitive advantage for you. Indeed, the changing workplace that confronts us today shouldn't be viewed merely as a temporary um, emergency measure during this pandemic, but rather as a peek into the future of the workplace, whether it's your home or in the physical office. So what will this new normal look like that's what our experts in real estate, in wellness, in design, and sustainability will share with all of us this morning. By the way, everyone, this forum is presented by Colliers International Philippines in partnership with Herman Miller and CWC Interiors with our media partner, the ABS-CBN News Channel, or ANC, which explains why I'm here this morning. <laughs> okay, listen in, this is very important. Courtesy of CWC Interiors, you, our participants, all of you, if you've registered early enough, uh, will have a chance to win, listen in, an Aeron Remastered Chair. So make sure to stick around until the end of the webinar and find out if you're the lucky winner of this iconic task chair produced by Herman Miller. If you're not around, you don't win that chair. We move on to the next uh, person on our, our raffle, okay? So that's gonna be really fun. An Aeron Remastered Chair in your homes or in your offices. So let's begin by introducing our speakers, everyone. All right, our keynote speakers, we have two of them, by the way, both of whom are overseas. But of course, it doesn't really matter because 
you could be next door or in Hong Kong or in the United States, and we wouldn't know anyway. We're all online at this point. But thanks to Zoom, they're with us this morning. I'd like to introduce our first speaker who leads Collier's International Wellness Consulting Business in Asia Pacific. She has extensive international consulting experience focused on integrating wellness and sustainability principles into corporate strategy, workplace, and building design. She brings this expertise to Collier's clients to ensure their spaces provide an environment that enhances their performance, productivity, and well-being, keyword there, well-being of their people. I'm pleased to introduce the Associate Director for Workplace Advisory Asia Pacific at Colliers International, Victoria Gilbert. Hello, Victoria. Good morning, Hi, Victoria. Dave. So, morning. let me guess, you're not in the Philippines, right? Where are you right now? Uh, I'm in Hong Kong, actually. Yeah. Don't you just miss hopping on a plane and flying over here to give a speech? Uh, yeah, it would be very nice to be there in person. Um, but like you said, we're all adapting to, uh, to the current reality. So here we are. We're still managing to have a conversation and uh, hopefully lots of people watching and hearing what we have to say. All right, Victoria, we can't wait for what you have to say. Go ahead with your presentation. We're Thank all you ears. Thank you. So today, um, first of all, I'm really happy to be back presenting again. Uh, as David said, a couple of years ago, we took a look at um, what does wellness look like in the, work, in the workplace. Today, we're gonna to touch upon some of the same topics, but we're gonna look at um, the future of the workplace, of course, in the context of COVID and where we are at today. So, next slide. The one thing we know, and we've known for a long time, is that um, wellness in the workplace is indeed a priority. Right now, we're seeing it's accelerating hugely. Um, we know that control of our environments has a direct impact on our health and well-being. And now this is more important than ever. If it wasn't important before, I think it's very, very clear that COVID-19 has spurred on the discussion uh, and made people realize that actually where we spend our days, our nights, um, the environments that we surround ourselves in really, really impact our health and well-being, whether it's the air that we breathe, the surfaces that we're touching, um, it doesn't matter. We've really got to make sure that those spaces are safe. Um, and obviously in the context of the office, we've all had to work from home. Many people are still working from home. And as we return to the office, what do we need to consider? What's it gonna look like? What's it gonna feel like? How should we behave? So that's what we're gonna go through a little bit today. I want to take you through what we know so far. So at Colliers, we've done a number of surveys uh, on a global scale, whilst uh, everybody has been essentially forced to work from home. Now, a lot of people, might be used to working from home because they could do it beforehand. What we know is that actually a lot of people, especially here in Asia, never had the opportunity to work from home beforehand. So we surveyed everybody to try and find out what we know so far in terms of what they desire, how productive they are, what their well-being was like, etc. And I want to share some of those findings with you today. So you can see here, 70%, this is a global statistic, the statistics slightly higher actually for APAC, um, but 70% said that they want to work remotely one to two days in the future. So that's huge for us. As David said, we're very used to getting together. Uh, we're very used to being in the office. But actually what we're seeing is people are quite enjoying the opportunity to work from home. Not that many people want to do it more than four days a week. So nobody's saying, oh, the office is dead. We don't want to go back there. And actually our lives are much better. Um, but what they're saying is the option to work remotely one to two days is something that's definitely going to be uh, the way forward. We also know that productivity has been a huge question mark for lots of business leaders and managers. Uh, people were wondering, are people going to be more productive? Are they just going to stay at home? Is anyone going to get out of bed? Are people going to log on? Um, all of these questions that maybe managers before weren't quite so confident that their employees would be able to be that productive. What we found actually is 78% said that their productivity either stayed the same or improved. Um, a lot of this is circumstantial. We know that people who um, have had kids who have been off school and at home have found their productivity perhaps more severely impacted. And the um, people who are living in a space where they can't have a dedicated workspace also have been uh, maybe not so productive. But by and large, we're finding that people are 
saying that their productivity is either as good or better than in the office environment. Um, but what do people miss? So it's all very well being happy, being at home, being more productive, but actually there's some things that the home environment can't provide. And what we found is that over 60% missed in-person collaboration with their colleagues. So collaborating over Zoom, over Teams, over whichever platform you're working on is fantastic. And the fact that we can even do that is a miracle. Um, but the actual in-person collaboration offers something different. And we also know that over 50% missed bumping into coworkers. So those are your water cooler conversations. The every so often you sort of in the office and somebody just stops you to grab a coffee or you overhear somebody talking about a project and say, oh, hey, I know about that. So we know that those can't be replicated outside of the office. And then a couple more statistics. These ones are Asia specific is uh, around technology. Obviously, we're here today talking about talking on Zoom, using technology to be able to have this conversation. Um, at least 53% find they have the right technology and tools. This is globally. Um, we foresee that that number is going to increase hugely. So some businesses were prepared already. Some people already use laptops, headsets, had Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever it is. Um, some more paper heavy, more traditional industries might not have been so ready. So they found it a little bit harder. What we foresee is that that's gonna ramp up over time. So if people aren't equipped with the right technology, of course their productivity gets impacted, but also their ability to actually enjoy their work. If you're constantly frustrated about the fact that this isn't working or this isn't working or I can't access that file or I can't get this piece of paperwork, whatever it might be, um, that's something that we see is probably going to change. But what we know at the moment is around 50% of people are okay with the technology they have at hand. Connectivity, so this relates back to the one we just talked about. Go back a slide. This goes back to the one we just talked about in terms of um, connecting with people. Now, nothing can replicate human connection and that in-person face-to-face. Um, but we have found that around 68% feel connected despite the different locations. So that's something to say that people are actually trying very hard to be connected. It's something that people want. And again, from the context of well-being, that human connection is something that's really, really important. So even though you can't have it in person and it's not easily replaceable, what we're finding is that actually the majority of people do feel that there is some kind of connection, some kind of person-to-person um, -person contact that is keeping them feeling like them and that they, they and their colleagues are still able to work together. And then lastly, 60% feel comfortable at home. Now again, there are lots and lots of variables and I know Tatiana is going to talk about this later, um, about how to make that work from home experience really, really work for you. Uh, it's not for everybody, it's new for a lot of people. And there's lots of things and there's lots of tips that you can do. What I'm gonna focus on is the issues uh, at large of, as we return to the office, what do we need to address in terms of our own well-being? We can obviously take these principles home, we can apply them in our in whole lives. Um, but what COVID has done is it's sort of, it's taken the wellness conversation, accelerated it, and then it's brought in some new issues that perhaps we weren't really thinking so deeply about beforehand. So these are the issues that we are thinking about. Uh, the first one being design and space considerations. I think a lot of people will have this on their minds already in terms of distancing, um, especially. We're obviously keeping big distance from each other at the moment, but what does that mean when we go back to the office? Improving air quality, which not everybody thinks about, but when we're using ventilated systems, uh, it's very important in terms of spread of disease. Um, here in Asia, we are very familiar with wearing masks, and that is because, um, because of airborne transmission. So we're going to look at the context, that in the context of the office. Supporting mental health, um, I think it will be remiss not to include this one. We know that mental health issues have been there, they've, they've always been there, and they've, for the past few years, been sort of creeping onto the corporate agenda, but we found that COVID has really seen a spike in people who are talking about the fact that they're more stressed, more anxious, more worried. And that's because of distancing, that's because of financial implications. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. So we need to think about how we can support mental health. Boosting immunity is the one thing we all need to be doing now, just to make our own bodies and minds um, strong so that if we do get any kind of uh, illness, that we're able to fight it. 
that our immune system is uh, hopefully operating at its optimal level so that we're able to able to deal with whatever whatever the world throws at us. And then of course, being prepared for disruption. In a business sense, what does that mean? How can you prepare your space? How, are you, how can you prepare your building? How can you prepare your employees? We don't know what's coming, but we do know that the world in the last few years has seen lots and lots of things that haven't necessarily been on the five-year plan. So we're gonna to start to think about how we can think about uh, changing the way we work, being very agile to be able to respond quickly. So this just gives you a snapshot um, of each of those things, the wellness and the future of work. We're going to look at each of these five things. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you uh, maybe about five key points on each. Uh, in the reading, you will see there's more detail on, it, on each of these, and we can also go into more detail later on in the question answer. So the first one, space. I talked earlier about design considerations um, and also behavior considerations. Um, this is an immediate one. This is something that we all need to do right now. If you're not back at the office already, maybe you're going back next week, the week after, maybe you're praying to go back soon. Um, but if you're not well, any kind of unwell, it doesn't matter what it is, stay at home. We know this, it's common sense, but nobody does it. Um, in my experience, people come to the office coughing and sneezing with a headache, with an ache, with a pain. Actually, we know, we, we know that you need to recover. You need to recover to be able to do your best work. You need to recover to be able to safely go into the office and not infect any of your colleagues. So that's number one, it's socially responsible behavior and it's very much common sense. Uh, some of the other things is regular sanitation and cleaning high touch surfaces. In offices, obviously there's, there's door handles, there's lift buttons, there's all sorts of things. We need to start to think about how we can um, sanitize more regularly, how we can have a cleaning schedule. Maybe it's the building management, Maybe it's your own office, um, that's something we need to look at. Uh, providing adequate sink space for hand washing. This is one that is actually a design feature. This comes from the well-building standard, whereby they suggest that when you're washing your hands, you need to be able to have enough space to wash them. And I'm not gonna show you how to wash your hands because I think everybody in the world now knows how to properly wash their hands. Um, but is there enough space to do that? Or do you touch the sides of the sink and do you touch the faucet while you're washing your hands? If so, you're actually going to be contaminating both your hands and, and, the, and the sink. So if it's possible to be able to have adequate sink space, then that's a design consideration that either in a new space or in a retrofit, you might be able to include. Um, soap and paper towels, again, very straightforward. Um, but the last one, guidance. So I think people are very aware now of what is, what is required in terms of hygiene. But often it was missed out of the conversation. It was assumed people know already. And I think there's a big piece to be, to be implemented on an on a office level around strategies. So having signage, reminding people, doing training on what it means to be safe, healthy and well. Um, and then we can include hygiene in that conversation. The next one is boosting immunity. So as I just mentioned, so this one is in the near term. Of course, there are things that you can do today. Um, for everybody watching at home, the first thing I would say to do right now is to have a glass of water. If you've got access to one, have some water. It's likely that you're dehydrated. Um, in fact, and some of you will have heard me say this before, but if you're slightly thirsty, that's an indication to, from your body that you are already dehydrated. So address your well-being right here, right now, and have a sip of water. Some of the other things you can do, we've put this as near term um, because they take a little bit longer. Of course, a lot of them are related to... Um, to diet and also to behavior. So some of the things that we can do at an office level are having fitness activities. Now, if you're allowed on site, having them on site uh, in line with social distancing. If not, using online platforms. We've talked loads already about the fact that there are lots of online platforms. Corporates can actually sub subsidize or offer free access to their employees. I've seen lots of companies do uh, group ones where people are either on the screen, for those who don't want to be seen on the screen doing a workout, you could do it this style, whereby people can watch and take part, but they're not seen. Um, also subsidizing when you go back to the office, healthy meals and snacks, and providing that education. So providing workshops, providing experts to let people know what should they be eating? What shouldn't they be eating? What should they be having more of? What constitutes a healthy diet? What types of vitamins do you need to be including? There's a lots and lots, the nutrition world is never ending. 
Um, but there's lots of basics that we can bring to every single employee for them to make simple changes to boost their own immunity. Um, and some of the other things you can do is not only providing food, but maybe partnering with a healthy provider to get discounts on delivery to the office or uh, if you go in store and say that you work for such and such a company, then you might be able to get a discount on a certain part of the menu. There's lots of different things that we can do when we work with clients on how we can make those subtle, subtle changes to make it easy for people. And then, of course, always providing uh, resources to be able to for people to educate themselves more or attend training. Um, I think now people are very aware that they need to be putting their wellness at the top of their individual agenda. Um, of course, we all have work to do. We all have busy lives. But if none of us are well enough to be able to conduct looking after our kids or getting a presentation finished or presenting to the board, whatever it might be, um, then actually none of it's going to happen. So I think this is really integral and quite simple steps people can take in the near, near term um, to address their own individual and therefore organizational health. The next one is coming. Uh, managing air quality. So I mentioned this one um, a minute ago, which is, this is largely related to mitigating the risk of transmission. Now we could be talking about COVID-19, we could equally be talking about um, particulate matter, uh, which we know we need to filter again for the health of our lungs and the health of our, health of our blood cells. So we need proper ventilation, proper filtration. Uh, we need to manage our temperature and humidity levels as well. So in the context of uh, COVID, there's been a lot of research on how air quality plays a role. And I can point anyone who's interested in the direction of resources and organizations who are doing amazing work and scientific uh, studies in this space. At a very high level, what I wanted to talk about is what we can do, you know, as we return to the office or as we sit at home. The first one is maximize ventilation. Again, like drinking water, it's quite easy. If you can open the window and the air quality outside isn't terrible, um, I would suggest opening the window and ensuring a flow of air through the space. If you're in a, in a space where you are bringing fresh air in from the outside, such as an office tower, increase the ventilation. This might be something that you have to partner with the landlord for. Uh, it might be operated by building management, but ask for that uh, increased ventilation to be able for people to be breathing more fresh air. Um, that can only ever be a good thing. There's also a correlation with having higher fresh air levels and concentration levels. So if you want to mitigate the headache in the middle of the afternoon, having more fresh air and less carbon dioxide is probably a good way to go. There's also lots of things like UV or ionization that you can do. And then I mentioned earlier, um, monitoring humidity. So a lot of the countries we live in, I'm in Hong Kong, it's very, very humid. So we need to bring the humidity down. In some places you need to increase the humidity. So depending on what the system is set at, 50 to 65% relative humidity is suggested to be the optimal range. Um, so again, making sure that you are or the building management or facilities management, whoever operates the space, is aware of the optimal air quality um, parameters, be that ventilation, filtration, humidity, temperature, then you're ensuring that people are breathing clean air and also that the quality is good enough for people to feel comfortable within the space. Preparing for disruption, notoriously difficult to do. Um, but what we can do is we can prepare the spaces as far as we know, and we can get protocols in place, measurement practices in place to be able to use them to our benefit when something comes our way. Now, this has been written in context of COVID. So midterm, we're looking at things that you can do now that are going to that are going to keep, keep us covered as we look towards the future. Uh, the first one is directly related to the one I just mentioned, which is monitor and review indoor environmental quality. So I just met, mentioned some things that you can do as immediate actions. Um, what actually I highly recommend is that you install monitors to get an ongoing understanding of what is the indoor environmental air quality like. Um, what, and, and that can also apply to, you can also do it for water, you can also do it for a couple of other things. So if you're monitoring, you can then measure uh, and periodically review. So this is something that we offer is to come in and uh, suggest how many monitors you would have in the space, suggest um, that you review maybe perhaps perhaps at the moment maybe monthly but you know going forward maybe quarterly to see how are you performing and are there any dips in performance and what can you do to improve them if you can maintain 
a high, a high quality performance over time, then obviously you're going to be better prepared if something happens. Um, technology is another one. We just talked about increasing flexibility and adaptability. Of course, if you have a laptop, if you have a mobile phone, if you have software installed on those devices that enables you, enables you, excuse me, to access the files that you need, the software that you require, enables you to speak face to face with your team, then you're going to be a lot more flexible. It doesn't matter, like David said, whether you're sat in the Philippines, in Hong Kong, in Japan, in China, wherever you are, you're going to be able to connect. Now, of course, it's not 100% foolproof, um, but if you can leverage technology where possible to make that a reality, um, in the future, should something like this happen again, I hope not, but should there be situations whereby we have to work from home or we have to change the way we're working, technology is our friend and technology can definitely help us with that. Um, so increasing connectivity, of course, that speaks exactly to that point. Um, information access is key. Uh, if we can't access the information, of course, then we can't use it. And then the last two you can see on the screen are not related to uh, flexibility at all, but they're actually about cleaning products and protocols. Of course, the better we can prepare our space, if something happens, we want to know that we've got all of the right protocols in place to be able to deal with that. And there is a lot of guidance out there from, from Well, from Fitwell, from lots of public health professionals, and also government guidance on what we should and shouldn't be using in the office space. Sometimes this is um, not required by one, one place or another. Um, so you'd have to check what the local, the local standards are. And I think that if the pr cleaning protocols and cleaning products are there and they're ready and people know what they are and they know how to use them, then it makes it a lot easier when you suggest it to people. You know, everybody's getting used to using hand sanitizer. Everybody's getting used to wearing a mask. If you have them ready and people know how to access them, then it makes it a lot easier if and when something happens and you need to increase the frequency like now um, that, you can, that you can use those. And then reducing stress. So I mentioned just before uh, talking about addressing mental health. Mental health is something that is unfortunately getting uh, more and more airtime because it's becoming more and more of an issue. Um, emotional stress related to social isolation uh, they're directly correlated. And we see that people are really struggling with social isolation, um, especially people who live on their own. We are, or, or people who are just very used to being in a busy environment all the time. Um, I think there is also um, a lot of stress around the current economic situation. So of course, being able to provide people with some support, with some, um, resources with information lets people know that they're being looked after lets people know that though they may be worrying there are people and there are resources and there are organizations that they can turn to so providing access to information is is huge corporates have a big role to play they can do it through their insurance they can do it through online training they can do it through uh on-site counsellors, there's lots and lots of ways of doing it. And also training managers is a key way to do that. So if managers are able to deal with mental health issues, they're able also then to not counsel, because you should always go to a professional for that, but able to answer questions from their team, able to answer questions from uh, the, the individuals that they work with. So I think being transparent and providing that information is very, very, is very, very important. Um, and then having wellness ambassadors within the organization, people who know uh, where these resources are, people who can uh, provide some direction, some advice, and also that the rest of the organization can turn to and say, do you know what, I'm really struggling with X. Um, could you provide me with some advice or where I should go? Um, and then also you can see there in the middle, and I'm gonna leave this to Tatiana to touch on in a lot more detail, but I think it's very, very key, especially working from home, is physical stress. So we talked before about boosting immunity and it's very important to have movement and fitness as part of that physical immunity piece. Um, but also if we look at it from a point of placing stress on the body, ergonomics is something that we really need to take into consideration. If we sit hunched over all day or we've got a terrible chair or whatever it might be, our body is gonna experience a lot of stress. And of course, uh, the body and the mind are very connected. Um, so those two definitely go hand in hand. 
So now we're going to do a tiny pulse check. We've got two questions for you. Um, I want this to be a very, very quick, uh, very quick answer. So we're going to start a live poll of which of the following statements do you feel are the most true? You should be able to see it pop up on your screen right now. Pick your top three. We're going to give you um, the best part of a minute to answer. And then we're going to show everybody the results so that we can get a, an idea of what people are thinking. Twenty more seconds if you haven't made your choices yet. Fab. So you can see there which ones do we think are the most true. Uh, so the top answer and thank you especially maybe it was biased given the presentation i've just given uh, but offices need to be made healthier and safer and then also 68 percent of people think we need to rethink our workplace strategy which i definitely think the conversations that we're having at colliers is around what do we need to do to make sure that actually it's it's right going forward that it's actually fit for purpose um i'm going to also pull out uh, the lowest two so unassigned seating is a thing of the past only four percent of people so that's interesting. There's been some debate around with social distancing, with hygiene, can we really you know, move around the office as freely as we used to? Do we need to go back to fixed desks? Do we need to go back to cubicles? Um, from here, it looks like we're not, we're not so keen on that. Um, and then also, people want to work in the office is very low as well. That's interesting. Um, I think we're seeing that there is a role for the office, whether people want to work there, this might be semantics. Um, remains to be seen. Great, fantastic. Well, let's move on to the second one. And it is similar, but which are the most important issues for companies to address in the near term? So in the next month or two. And if you can answer with just uh, one response, and if there's really two you can't choose between, then two responses is okay. Again, you've got a, a minute. Okay. So, most important issues. Uh, again, very happy to see improving health and well being in the workspace. That directly correlates with what we just saw on the last one. So, thank you for all being consistent. Um, and then, working from home effectively is also the second, the second most important issue in the near term, which is absolutely perfect uh, given what we're going to talk about next. So I'll leave it at that and uh, we'll close the poll. Thank you very much for your participation. I'm going to leave you with six immediate actions, which are um, things that you can consider implementing. There are obviously many more things you can do and we can have a conversation about what might be right for your business. Um, but a quick six are understand your employee priorities. Ask the question, what do people want? Uh, how are people feeling? Are people okay or not? Uh, secondly, review your wellness strategy. Re do you even have one? Uh, if not, maybe think about creating one. Put mental health on the agenda. Monitor your air quality. Communicate, communicate. It's very, very important to be transparent. And prepare an office remote working protocol that's fit for purpose. So we've just seen people are interested in both the office and home. How do we actually create a balance that works between the two?
And with that, um, if you want any more information, my contact details are on the screen. I'm going to hand over to David. Um, any questions you can ask in the Q&A section at the end. I'm going to hand over to David to take on the next part of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria Gilbert, coming to us live from Hong Kong. Thanks, Victoria. My pleasure. Stay where you are, okay, because we'll have you back for the open forum. Um, yep. Thank you so much for those valuable insights, and thank you for practical tips, including everyone, let's hydrate with some water, okay? Yep. I think that's really important. Okay, so wow, I went through some of those um, results of the surveys. Clearly, 14% of us still want to work in the office. That's revealing, okay? And uh, <laughs> a lot of the concern was really about work from home. In fact, in the first survey that you showed us, um, a great majority, more than 70%, um, are open to working from home and f actually feel productive, if not even more productive, while working at home. That's really interesting. It was also funny, 50% miss their colleagues at work. 50% <laughs> miss bumping into their colleagues at work. Okay, so let's continue now. Thanks, Victoria. Let's move on to our next speaker, our keynote speaker, also live from Hong Kong. And uh, our next speaker is a workplace strategist, creative designer, and enthusiastic social entrepreneur. As a workplace knowledge consultant, she's not only an adaptable professional, but also a strategic advisor to clients in order to deliver not only innovative change management strategies or design spaces, but also to provide and build long lasting professional relationships with clients. Everyone, let's welcome the workplace knowledge consultant of Herman Miller, Tatiana Gomez. Tatiana? Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the great intro, David. Um, okay, so thank you so much for having, um, for making the time today during these unprecedented times. Uh, Herman Miller is not only a furniture company, we are a company that looks at the experience of work in a holistic way. But before we start, I believe most of you are still working from home, which has never been the norm, right? So today I am not going to talk about furniture. I would like to share with you some information, hoping to bring you uh, some thought starters. So as I go through this presentation, we will be looking at not only the experience of work or the physical space, but also people and the way work gets done. Not because we haven't been back to the workplace, it doesn't mean that we haven't been working hard and possibly for longer hours, maybe prior to COVID-19. Um, today I will share on a high level what are those immediate needs, what's next, and what are the considerations ahead. So first is starting with immediate needs. And what we all need to, to understand is basically why, what we all share and what is that end goal, but with a different approach based on your organization. And probably a shift in the management methods and policies would be needed to fully align with the new work style. And mostly, most importantly, high level of hygiene management would be required to support the safety of people's health when they return to the workplace. So what we say is that one size does not fit all. Now that we understand the general facts of how the work style has changed during these past months or so, and what new requirements people will be expecting for their office when they return, in case they return, uh, let's think of the factors we should consider when you redesign the, the workspace or the place. So always having a holistic approach between management, um, places, tools, and technology. Next one. Uh, in many of the recent conversations that we are having with clients, the common topic is how do we bring people back into the office? Uh, as we continue to adapt and change uh, the best way we can, I believe it's very important to ask ourselves as company leaders, as employees, as stakeholders, uh, why are we returning to the office, whom and when? Uh, also, how do we facilitate the process of returning to the workplace 
uh, not to say that the office is going to go away, and Victoria already made a point on that, but just to make sure that, they are, that we have a right approach as we continue to work from home. Um, also, how do we lead through change and how do we combat communication and change fatigue? Always asking who and why uh, we are doing this. Next slide, please. So I would like to start the presentation and just sharing uh, some data. So this piece of research comes from Leesman and this was recently uncovered and when they conducted an online survey with a, around 10,000 plus employees from different organizations around the world, particularly looking at the home settings. Um, firstly, when you look at the age groups on the left hand side of your screen, we identified that 64% uh, of the respondents are between age 25 to 44, followed by 30% uh, at the age of 45 to 64%. If we look at the, at the, um, at the top left-hand side of the screen, 38% of those respondents said that they have a dedicated work from home um, office space. 28% has a dedicated area, but not a separate room. And 33% has a non-specific um, home location. That could be uh, a dining table, that could be your sofa, that could be on your kitchen surface. So when you look at the right-hand side of your screen and you look at the answers, uh, so there are, there are three highlighted uh, questions. Uh, with their answers. And when you look at the, um, what, what we have and what Lisman has unveiled is a very incredible findings. Um, people responded in a very positive way and to working from home. And this correlates with what already uh, Victoria has presented um, in, um, previously. And it basically says that uh, if you go from higher, it goes from a higher percentage to a lower percentage. And is when you have a dedicated private space, uh, you have a higher uh, satisfaction working from home than when you are not not have you don't have a a dedicated workspace in your home. However, people seem to be more engaged and more productive when working from home. So next slide, please. So I want to highlight. Uh, when we think about the people, what does it mean to come back to the office space? Uh, we are questioning things that we never questioned before, whether or not I shall be touching the door handle or I am comfortable touching surfaces in our workspace. As we saw on the previous slide, um, from a macro level with, with Leesman findings to a micro level with a survey conducted by Herman Miller with 330 respondents located in the west coast of North America we got a very similar results. And I'm just going to link some of the points and questions in the left to the results in the right. So when people were asked whether or not they wanted to, to work from home, and this was a survey that we took three weeks into working from home, unfortunately working from home. Uh, when people were asked about working from home, then you see the results, you have 87% uh, adapted satisfactorily to work from home. Um, however, if you go to the next one, please, one more click, 15% uh, identified that they want to return uh, to what we have prior to COVID-19. Um, however, when, uh, when we were asked whether or not uh, you want to have a sense of balance between working from home and working in the workspace, um, we have, we have an, uh, bigger statistics and what when people were asked whether or not they want to return to the workspace, 81% of people identified that they want to return to the workspace, not to work, but just to be with colleagues. Uh, one more click. So 58% are concerned about being together. So it's, it's quite interesting. If you see people want to go back to the workspace to see their colleagues just for the social interaction, however, they are still concerned whether or not how many people are, are, are we going to be in, in the same room or in, in, in the office environment. Um, 
when we ask what was the success or, or how people adjust to work uh, effectively from home, 73% of the respondents understood and identified that positive check-ins and communications were key. So these communications not only happen from stakeholders, managers, um, vertical lines, but also from coworkers. So not only checking on your employees on work, work-related matters, but just also ask your employees, how are you doing? Um, and lastly, one more click. 47% identify that they would like to return and that the future of work and the, and the future of the way how we work and collaborate, it will be a mix between working from home and working in the, in the workspace. The next one. So we are finding two different strategies. Um, so the first one, uh, when we talk about what is the return to workplace, uh, what, what is your approach? Uh, we have identified that there's a return to the workplace strategy, and this is a specific to certain industries. Uh, and then there is a work from home uh, that we have identified is, is mostly happening with tech companies. So you already know Google and Facebook. Uh, they tweeted that they are not going to be returning to the work uh, space. Only essential workers are going to, to return. So when we talk about return to the workplace, there are three main things that we are actually suggesting uh, companies to question themselves. So the first one is how is your organization working to understand and implement published guidelines? Um, second one, do you have work from home program? Uh, did you have a work from home program prior to COVID-19? Was it working? Was it not working? And why? Um, and the third one, what is your plan for, for, for returning to your workspace? So what we say is that remote, uh, remote working could be a key component to your real estate optimization goals. And probably that would be some of the questions that we can direct to colleagues uh, after the presentation in the Q&A. Um, as well, when we talk about working from home, there are three things that we, that we also identify. So the first one is uh, do a strategic analysis to determine work, uh, work from home candidates. Uh, do a meaningful home office setting. So just uh, as a company, as an organization, just check whether or not your employees are actually capable to set up uh, and have a comfortable work from home um, environment. And the third one, um, and it's one of the most important, the things that we have actually unveiled in some of other surveys uh, with clients is basically uh, do ergonomic assessments what is the impact of mental health and well-being whilst you are working for prolonged uh, periods of time uh, from home? Next one. So as we move forward, I would like to start with working from home. Um, as probably many of you are still working from, from your workspace, from your, from your home, I am working from our workspace here in Hong Kong. So I would like to probably just bring out some ideas and some of these findings um, specifically from our well-being team and our ergonomics team. So what we say is that your workspace and your settings, go back one, please. <laughs> your workspace should respond to the ever-changing needs of your day. So it should be able to help you achieve uh, your best emotional, physical and cognitive well-being. So a lot of companies really don't talk about their best emotional and cognitive well-being, but we have understood that it's, it's a key factor of working from home. So next one, please. So as we saw in the unveiled data, we can satisfactory uh, be working from home. Uh, here there are a few things that we should consider when setting up our spaces. So there are four easy tips for you to set an adequate ergonomic environment. So first one, uh, get a natural uh, lighting. So have as much as you can access to natural lighting. Use a headset, a headset if you are on the phone a lot. Um, number three, use a ratio of one to one seat to scan. And this refers to 
for every 30 minutes that you're sitting down, uh, you should stand for 30 minutes. And the fourth one, uh, walk around or stretch for at least two minutes before sitting back and get up and down of your chair every hour. So these are just basic, uh, simple tips that you can implement when working from home. Next one. So these tips will help you and, and will, uh, will guide you uh, to, uh, and the way how to establish a work from home environment that supports your overall well-being and contribute to uh, you doing your best work. So no matter where you are, whether or not you have a private space or whether or not you're working from your dining table, uh, try to make it as uh, pleasant as possible. So whether in a, in a studio apartment at the kitchen table um, is important and, and we are saying that it is possible to create a space that helps you remain engaged and productive. So if you look on the right hand side of the screen, we call it WARM program. And these are just basic high level tips. Um, so the first one, define your workspace. So whatever you wanna sit down every day when you're working from home, just, just define that one. Second one, physical activity. We understand that whilst working from home, we are actually reducing our physical activity. So make time throughout your routine. Uh, to squeeze, uh, even walking around in, in your home. Um, the third one, create a routine. This is very, very important. So probably not the same routine as when you were uh, going to your workspace because you are not commuting, but try to create a routine that makes sense uh, to you. Uh, the number fourth, it would be make time to relax and meditate. And it seems very simple, but we do tend to forget, even at the workspace, to take a step back and just have two or three minutes of contemplation uh, when you're not thinking about work. So if you look on the right hand side, we, we call this matrix uh, commit uh, to working well from home. So these are a few things that just, um, I'm not going to elaborate on all of them, but um, I would like just to point out that you should dedicate work time. You should check whether or not your technology works. Uh, be able to communicate your needs and be straightforward with your clients, with your, uh, with your, stay, with your managers, uh, with your colleagues. What are your needs? What do you need to perform your work from home? Also commit to health. So establish boundaries, basically, as Victoria said, drink some water, uh, eat in a healthy way, try not to hit the fridge every two minutes. So also establish a routine on, on your meals um, and have some dedicated downtime. So as, as well as you plan your day, your work day routine, just plan when you take some breaks. Next one. So what started as a forced necessity has quickly turned into the world's largest work process proof concept, right? So in the near future, probably some companies, and we have heard from some of our clients that companies are giving monetary incentives to employees to purchase furniture. So a careful review and analysis of your organization's structure goals, objectives, and overall workplace strategy should be conducted. This will be done in order to determine which business units, teams, and individuals might be great candidates uh, for working remote, and what are those arrangements that companies have uh, to actually do and set up for those employees to work satisfactorily uh, from home. So, um, let me ask you, what is your company doing at the very moment to, to support you to work from home? So if you see, we have on the left hand side, just a little diagram, and it's just to, to give you um, an indication of how you should be sitting down, how you should be uh, placing your laptop, your computer, your desktop, and just simple guidelines. So when you go to the next slide, please. So we are actually inviting you, and I want to invite you all to take 
our work from home assessment tool. This is a tool that we have developed um, around a month ago by our uh, ben, uh, well-being team. Uh, this is just to share my ergonomic stats. So not because I work at Herman Miller, uh, it means I have a very high satisfactory uh, work from home uh, scoring percentage. So uh, what basically this ergonomic assessment is going to give you uh, a breakdown on three um, key elements. So, and it's going to give you recommendations. So the first one is going to be on your environment. The second one uh, on your physical support and the third one on the ways of working. So I invite you all just to go to uh, our workfromhome.hermanmiller.com uh, assessment. Next one. So as we are ahead of the curve uh, in APAC here in Hong Kong, uh, we would like to share how we returned uh, to work at our, at our headquarters. So next one. So at the entrance lobby, measurements in play, there are measurements in place by the building management. When arriving at the lobby floor, people must walk through the indicated paths. So the set infrared camera monitors that you see on the left-hand side of the presentation uh, can effectively take the temperature and uh, when people enter and leave the, the facility. So when the camera identifies that someone has a body, uh, a higher body temperature, that person is pulled aside and gets the temperature check uh, manually. So the next one. So this is just to show you our flow plate. And, and some of the guidelines that we're following have been established by local governments. So take a note that some of the guidelines are different what, for what governments might implement in other regions. Uh, however, what is compulsory for Herman Miller in every single location in APAC uh, is um, wearing a mask and temperature checks are compulsory on arrival. Next one. So just to show you a little bit of, of our photograph of our office, how does it look like at the moment? So we got sanitizer across the floor plate as well as uh, green color available pads on desk and chairs. This might uh, look to you as common sense. However, we found out that people shall be directed and informed of where they can be sitting down and, or what are those new policies. So there are also signs of on, on, unavailable seats within the workspace. Next one. So just to wrap up the, the first part of the, of the conversation, um, what we know, some of the findings and what we know from our clients uh, in APAC, our clients globally, and what is happening in our Michigan uh, headquarter is that you first have to empower people to come in to the workspace or stay at home. Do not break employees' trust by requesting uh, back laptops or other devices that were provided during the quarantine. Uh, this also ties with the leaders to understand the nature of remote working was mitigating the risk of low employee engagement and satisfaction. You, you can click on the... rely on sensor data to understand where were the, the prior to COVID-19 patterns, just to understand when during the week you have peak times and basically when you have a low attendance. So probably those days you can conduct deep cleaning. Next one. Another one. And what we have already mentioned is very important to have a a training and a communication strategy that escalates from stakeholders, uh, from CEO, from managers' lines, all the way all the way down. So what we're still trying to figure out, and this is what we're going to see on the right hand side of the screen, if you click this. So uh, what we have understood is that, or we, we haven't understood yet, is which physical barriers will reduce the risk uh, and spread. How policies working from home will evolve and change. This is 
is still yet to know. Uh, also, how visitors um, and what is the management and health screenings uh, and how that could possibly start before people reach the building. So uh, probably use of health apps to access public transportation or registration, very commonly and popularly used in China. And last but not the least important, what are those science-based materials that will keep us safe or will give us the perception of being safe? So now let's move into the workspace. Next one. So one thing that I really, uh, I really like from Victoria's presentation is when she said that remote, remote working uh, doesn't make sense for companies or roles. And uh, what we're saying is that leaders need to consider the demands of the job and how time spent working remotely could positively or negatively impact an employee's ability to deliver on business outcomes. So, these are just key points that we unveil from a research piece from Gallup. And what they have found out, this is from 2019 prior to COVID-19, is that working remotely can positively influence employee engagement and performance. Uh, however, the gains can vary by role and are the most noticeable when, when employees still maintain some connection to their home base. Next one. So something that we would like to address here is the, the, the use of physical distancing instead of talking about social distancing. Um, so more than ever, we have proven to be capable to evolve and use tech tools to stay socially connected. Um, so when planning to return to your workspace, the World Health Organization guidelines uh, recommended a minimum of six feet apart or two meters distance. And the way how to calculate it is from the center point of every chair in the office. Next one. So we just talked about the immediate needs, but what, what's next? Uh, so why are we returning to the workplace? What would be required for an air engineering control systems? how a place can be better data informed, and what are those new guidelines based on the collected information prior to COVID-19 and during COVID-19. So what we're saying is that when evaluating loan plans for remote work, examine what happens when employees experience change, um, how to combat fatigue and turn work from home into a positive experience, and basically an act, an act of trust. Next one. So how would, your, how would you adapt your existing floor plate and what is the impact uh, that you will have in the workplace matrix? So when we conducted this very simple exercise with around 100 uh, floor plates that we had in our archives, uh, what we have identified is that you implement physical distancing, you are going to experience reduction on an overall, overall seat headcount of 50%. Uh, what we have identified is that the, the reduction on desk goes or can go down to 37%. And when you're actually looking into uh, enclosed group seat areas, so this could be a training room, a meeting room, the reduction goes down on almost 40%. So, when you look on the right hand side, you have a before and after, and this is basically having an exercise of physical distancing. So this also will, will be able to inform you how do you plan chips for people to return to the workspace based on, on the limited capacity that you already have in, in your floor plate. Next one, please. So one key thing, we already talked about reduction in the seating area, but we haven't spoken uh, how you can repurpose or how you will repurpose meeting rooms. As we are all using conferencing videos, we basically don't need to be physically in, in, in the same room to conduct a meeting. And what we, what we see is that uh, clients are planning to shift more, most meeting rooms to virtual in the near term. So consider whether your employees can attend conference 
uh, via video conference, via Zoom, and whether or not you need to do always uh, a video conferencing. Um, so here there are several considerations for repurposing those spaces. So the first one is reduce the occupancy of enclosed uh, spaces and increase frequent frequency of cleaning shared spaces with a high turnover throughout the day. Second one, leverage scheduling tools to integrate cleaning time between meetings. And lastly, chief meeting room um, spaces to use for individual work. So next one. So this is just a neighborhood on how a, typically, a typical neighborhood uh, looks like or, was, or look like prior to COVID-19. So what we are saying um, is that when you look at the, at the right-hand side and when you implement physical distancing, there are key things that you should take into consideration. So when you maintain the suggested two meters apart distance, this vary depending on the country, uh, you can reconfigure your working station. So you can change the orientation uh, of your working station. Uh, you can increment flexibility, so probably convert some of those meeting rooms, as you see in the, in the example that we have, we converted a meeting room into a dedicated work point. And what we have also done is um, change the, the side wall of, of, of the meeting room, uh, the outside um, wall that was probably a collaboration, an impromptu collaboration wall, just turn it into a into a more of a jump space and turn it into a collaboration area. Also create some boundaries. So how can you create some boundaries? If you can uh, use some screens, we have understood that screens are not going to keep us apart, are, are not going to protect us from the virus, however, are going to give us the perception that we are safer in the workspace. And also, um, have and implement across the floor plate sanitizing cards. So next one. So creating physical and perceived boundaries in your space would be critical to maintain people's safety as they come back to work. Uh, you can think about boundaries at three different levels. So standing, seated, and the circulation. So the ages of a space that define pathways throughout the workplace. Uh, so keep in mind that screens, panels, and antimicrobial surfaces aren't necessarily effective, um, although they can make people feel psychologically more comfortable. So there are many surfaces in buildings that are not antimicrobial, like doorknobs, um, lips, uh, bottoms, um, surfaces, general surfaces. So uh, just make sure that you have and that you increment the, the, clean, the cleaning regimes, also that you increase the air exchange, that you, um, that you facilitate for people to wear masks in the workspace. And what we have understood that basically also having a sign-in sheet and having a temperature check uh, it gives you a contact tracing that will likely make a bigger difference in actual mitigation and identifying maybe a, a possible case of contamination. So how can, we, how can we look currently at data to inform when a space is over utilized or when it's under utilized? So what we say is basically uh, base your decisions on, 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 on data. Um, and the way how you can do it, we, we all have Outlook, we all have checking ins and out, we all have budgets. So please, before you implement any policy and when you're facing your return to work, uh, inform those decisions based on data. Next one. So what I, so we already talked about the immediate needs. What's next? And then thinking ahead. So what are yet th 
things that, that we are formulating and we, we, we're, we're still learning. So what is the future of the workspace? Uh, until now, we have understood that uh, and identified that offices are that space in which people socialize, uh, create and innovate when together. Also, when having a designated area to work at home, the percentage of productivity and focus downtime increases. Uh, so what we want to have is basically the option and flexibility to work from home as well as come and return into your workspace. So I would like to wrap up uh, our point of view, our high level point of view uh, with which phrase, with, with this phrase, which I found uh, relevant to this very moment in time. And it says, all change is hard at first, messy in the middle and beautiful at the end. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Beautiful at the end as, as, as expected. Thank you for that presentation. Basically reinforcing what Victoria's findings uh, showed us that people are indeed open to working from home or willing to work from home, but are somewhat struggling to create a conducive office or a home office environment, conducive to productivity and of course to wellness. Of course, the other thing that she also uh, uh, shared with us is that of course, there will always be a challenge for us as we expect employees to return to work it's how to make them feel safe uh, and how to make them feel comfortable and uh, secure in, in the workplace that they're returning to. So thank you so much, uh, Tatiana. And of course, to Victoria, we'll have them again after the break for the open forum. And we'll also introduce two new panelists along with them. But we're going to take a quick break. Let me just remind everyone, it's a very short break, maybe just three to four minutes. But use this few minutes to, to do what Tatiana and Victoria just uh, uh, shared with us. Victoria said, hydrate yourself, grab uh, some water and hydrate ourselves. And uh, Tatiana said, um, stand up, stretch, walk around a bit, uh, get your blood circulating. It's not, it's, we've been here for more than an hour sitting in our chairs. So stand up a bit and, and stretch. Just don't go back to sleep, please, if you're at home. And don't hit the fridge in case you're tempted to do that. So we'll leave you with some messages from Herman Miller. When you return, it's your chance to ask questions. We'll have our open forum in a short while. Please be back. I'm Pam Susamawatanakun, Managing Director of Superish Thailand, Currency Exchange. I love what I do. I love my people. I love talking to them, hearing them, what they think, and hearing their voices. When I joined the family business, it was their generation that creates to deliver the experience for that generation. But now we have different generations as our customers. So we have to combine the ways to attract new customers and also maintain the same customer that we have been serving. I like minimal design, like more towards something that would last long. But there's also this attention to detail, but you can tell the difference. It's just the small details that people may not see, but it's that little thing that makes a difference. My name is Gavin Von Kusokit. I'm the Managing Director of Glowfish. So Glowfish is a creative community. We have co-working space. We have flexible offices, flexible in the hours and also uh, in the sizes. We have a dining community, five different restaurants, two fitness, a base and physique, and we have an event space that we do 350 events a year. I work with three different teams in three different locations, so I'm pretty much on the move all the time. It's pretty much a hot desk environment. Um, we can work anywhere, in a dining hall, or um, I like to just come up uh, to wherever the problems are. and spend my time there. It's pretty much a quality of life improvements for our customers. I mean, we're offering uh, this custom chair as an upgrade. It's designed uh, for easy collaboration and it looks fantastic.
Oh, what a beautiful chair. It's a costume chair, just one of the many award-winning designs of Herman Miller. And speaking of Herman Miller and award-winning designs, don't forget uh, you have a chance to take home the Aeron remastered chair, the Aeron being one of the most iconic task chairs ever made. And uh, you have a chance to take that home with you at the end of this program. Okay, so please stick with us because at the end of this webinar, we will be announcing the lucky winner, but, but, but you have to be around to be, to win that chair. So if you've uh, moved around the house, please come back because we're about to begin with the second part of our webinar. And this is your chance and my chance as well to, to ask questions to our panelists. So we'd like to bring back uh, Tatiana Gomez, if she can come back on screen, uh, together with Victoria Gilbert of Colliers International. Please come back on screen. There you are. Hi, Tatiana. Hi, Hi Victoria. Hello. Did you get your water? Did you stretch around, move around? Yes, I'm actually standing up. <laughs> okay, I love what you said. Try to stay away from the refrigerator because one of the, one of the dif difficult things about working from home is, well, you know, we, wanna, we all want to be healthy, right? But sometimes when you hit the fridge too often, uh, that's mm -hmm. going to be a problem, okay? So, okay, thanks, uh, Tatiana, uh, Victoria. Um, I'm going to introduce our other panelists, by the way. I'd like to welcome back all our participants, um, more than 600 of them who've logged in so far. Welcome back to our webinar, Life Spaces, the Future of the Workplace. This is presented by Colliers International Philippines in partnership with CWC Interiors and Herman Miller, and of course, our media partner, the ABS-CBN News Channel, ANC. So let's begin our open forum. And apart from Tatiana and Victoria, we're happy to have with us two others. Our first panelist is the president and CEO of CWC International and CWC Interiors. CWC has been serving the office fit-out business for almost 30 years now, providing high-quality premium furniture and architectural products, including Herman Miller, as I just said. Our panelist is a firm believer that the success of the company all through these years is largely because of its commitment to provide value through innovative solutions and by always being at the forefront of change. Now, he has brought CWC to new heights during the pandemic through Herman Miller campaigns as he has seen and understands the change in trends that the new norm poses. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of CWC International and CWC Interiors, Frederick Hughes. And Fred, good to have you again. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. All right. I love your virtual background. Fred is actually at home, right? <laughs> I'm at <laughs> home. to be at work. <laughs> this is the background of my office in our, our nice. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Fred. Uh, I'd like to also bring in another uh, panelist. Um, he has commercial responsibility for Herman Miller in Southeast Asia and also holding a pan-Asia role for the Herman Miller Asia offering portfolio. He has been with Herman Miller since 2001. Wow, spending most of these 17 years managing the Southeast Asia business. In addition, he also has the opportunity with Herman Miller to lead the commercial team in Greater China for two years from 2007 to 2009. Prior to joining Herman Miller, he worked as a sales manager in Steelcase Office Solutions in Singapore. He's a native of Singapore and a graduate of the University of Western Australia. Let's all welcome the Regional Sales Director for Southeast Asia at Herman Miller, Alex Say. Alex, hello. There you are, Alex. Hi, David. Hi, how are you? Hi, everyone. All right. Uh, I see you've shaved your lockdown beard. Last time we, were, <laughs> we chatted, uh, you had, it was pretty long. But good to see yeah. you safe and sound at home. Yes, I'm actually, in fact, uh, locked down in home for almost two months already. All right. I think our participants can't wait to, to, to hear what you have to say and answers to our questions. Uh, we'll, get, we'll have a chance, by the way, to get to your questions, but I'd like to ask a few of my own based on, on your presentations. And let me start with um, Tatiana and Victoria. Uh, please, uh, any, either of you could answer this question. You know, the trend before COVID hit, before this pandemic hit all of us by surprise, was towards open plan collaborative spaces. Uh, people were saying this flattens the organization. It engenders collaboration, creativity. It's a much more inspiring, less confining office environment. Um, now, the problem is what kind of implication would this have now as people go back to the barriers, people go back to the cubicles, people go back to staying away from each other, having their own corners. Uh, what would be the downside of this and how can we best um, neutralize the downsides of 
this going back to very segmented office spaces. Let me start with Tatiana. Yes, so I think what this has given us is an opportunity to identify that we have been planning the office spaces for extroverts. So that's mm. why we had these very open collaboration spaces everywhere, but we have never catered for introverts and for focus work. Mm -hmm. And what we had identified with a research piece that we have with Herman Miller is how important um, is to have downtime and actually cater offices, uh, not just for extroverts, but for introverts. So actually what, what this is giving us is the opportunity to think a little bit more, how do we cater for those needs? Mm -hmm. uh, it, not necessarily that we are going to return to cubicles because mm -hmm. what we have seen uh, in, in our research, Victoria presented, uh, some of their research in the surveys and what we have seen with Leesman and with Gallup is that people are actually craving for social interaction. Mm -hmm. So probably what we're seeing in the directions and we're doing some research piece that we probably will be issuing in the next two months. Okay. It's basically how are we going to cater and how important uh, is to cater for, uh, for the mind of individual work. All right. So what's happening right now is like a recalibration of the office space, which this pandemic has helped us uh, rethink this uh, exuberance towards collaborative spaces that really only perhaps benefit extroverts. Now, yes. Victoria, I'm not sure if you're an introvert or an extrovert or somewhere in between, but uh, your insights on this sudden shift again uh, from the off open plan collaborative workspace to a retreat to the cubicles. Yeah, so um, our perspective is somewhere, I, I don't think we're going to go back to cubicles. Mm -hmm. I also, my personal opinion is, I hope we don't go back to cubicles because I don't like the idea. Mm -hmm. However, what I think we're going to see is, I think we're going to see a, a change of workplace strategy. So it came out in the poll that we did just before, that we need to rethink our workplace strategy. What does that actually mean? It sounds, it sounds very highbrow, but I think what that means is people are going to look at some kind of hybrid solution. Mm -hmm. Some offices are, might remain traditional and say, we want one person to one desk. What mm -hmm. we're gonna do is we're just gonna increase the distance between the desks. Um, in order to answer your, your, your original question is that maintain some element of social distancing, but we still have people in the office mm -hmm. um, able to work together, talk to each other. Some companies might go for a one day a week at home. Some companies might go for split 50-50. Um, I think there's lots of different scenarios we're going to see coming out that are going to be tailored towards the organization. So what we're doing with our clients and what we're doing in our research is looking at what are those different scenarios. Now, what we think is there's going to be a number of different hybrid solutions whereby they, it will cater for um, both extroverts and introverts, if we're going to look at it from that perspective, but also it will cater for the need for potentially more space between people and at the same time having a different number of people in the office. Okay. So I think a number of different solutions are going to come out of this. All right. But no I, can hear, I can hear a bird in the background. I'm yeah. not sure where that's coming from, but... When you work from home, you never oh. know, right? It, it, it's, it, it's fun, yeah. actually. Uh, uh, Tatiana, uh, just a follow-up <laughs> uh, on that question. Um, you know, previously, the, the movement was towards more creative spaces, right? More inspiring spaces. In fact, even more playful spaces. Um, and we've seen furniture and designs um, adjust to that kind of uh, a phenomenon. Um, we're, what we're seeing now is spaces that are being converted into antiseptic spaces. They look like clinics. They sometimes look like laboratories, but people overdo it. How do you find a balance between making employees feel safe and at the same time, keeping the space still in inspiring, creative, and hopefully playful? Or is that wishful thinking at this point? <laughs> I think it's a bit of everything, but what we have said to clients and customers is like, do not rush to buy screens do not rush to get back into cubicles because we're still yet to find the answers. We still don't know what are those things that can facilitate. And Victoria um, made a good point uh, in her presentation with the air circulation and what is happening with HVAC systems. So what we're saying is um, take, take a moment for, to reflect, to check your data. Uh, do not invest heavily on something that probably is, is not going to work in the next six months or maybe in a year, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're saying is do a proper communication channel whilst people are working from home and actually make informed decisions of who has to stay working from home and who needs to come back into the workspace. So these right. are the conversations that we're having. It's more on a change uh, management. It's, it's more of all policies and how do you implement different policies in the workspace. So what we're saying right now is like, do not buy furniture yet. Uh, do get people equipped with the things that they have to uh, get to at home. So get them a, a good chair, get them a good task uh, lamp, but don't buy cubicles and don't remove things from the workspace because there's, there's also the psychology of when you turn your workspace into a, a sanitized, almost like clinic, people by default are not going to be, want actively to return to the, to the workspace. All right. Victoria, just very quickly, would you like to add to that? You know, the, the, the dilemma now is that you want to keep your workspace safe, clean, um, but you don't want to overdo it because um, then it, it lowers the, the productivity and the inspiration level for most employees. When you're frightful, it doesn't help. Yeah, absolutely. And I think fear is, is, is not really what we want to instill in people. What we want to instill is confidence. Um, and so there's a fine line between the two. But I think one of the things in terms of, like Tatiana said, not going like all out because we don't really know yet. But what we do know is we know that increased sanitation is a good thing. So communicate about that. We know that changing people's behaviors, getting them to maybe take the initiative to, you know, if they are going to move around different desks every day, and I do this, is just wipe it down, take care of your own, you know, laptop and mouse and whatever it is that you use um, and be a bit more aware. Use signage, use education. And as I mentioned earlier, monitor and give people the data, give people the reassurance. So rather than stripping everything out and making it look like a hospital, I think actually you can just add a lot of things to your existing space, use it slightly differently. Like you said, it might be on a 50-50 basis of mm -hmm. some people go into the office and some people don't. So that people can slowly start to get used to what something new rather than being told, you know, we've changed everything. We've done everything. It's completely different now. Like don't touch anything. You know, like when you're a kid and you get told like, don't touch anything, you'll make a mess. And you're scared. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Victoria, for that answer. I want to go to Alex um, on that point. I think the reason why people are enjoying working from home to a certain extent, or at least are more open to working from home at this at this time is because they feel safer at home than having to get to the office, commute to the office, check in into a, to a building. Um, now it's interesting what Google has just announced that they're offering, actually giving a thousand dollars per employee working yeah. at home, so that they could buy uh, the proper equipment uh, to use at home. Um, what do you think should be prioritized at home? What equipment? Um, I think interesting, Victoria's survey showed that many people felt they didn't have the technology, the right technology uh, inside their homes. Where should they invest in, both um, techno in technology and in furniture? I think, David, uh, one point that I, I would uh, like to add on to what Victoria has mentioned, it's basically uh, working from home, you probably need uh, ergonomic um, furniture, like a good task chair that can support uh, you for sitting for a long period of time, a work desk that a proper work desk that uh, is able to you know uh, for you to work on, and also invest on work tools like monitor arms that you can actually have the support of the your your screens so that you can have a good uh, you know line of sight when you work. I think those are the key uh, factors that that will actually uh, help to increase the productivity in. Uh, the work from home uh, program then? I think for the first weeks and months, maybe people were satisfied with their kitchen table. They were satisfied <laughs> with the kitchen stool for work. Do you think that's changed now? You think uh, there's a need now uh, to, to, to redesign homes have, I think it was Tatiana's um, presentation, right? So let me go to you, Tatiana, where it, uh, productivity increased when they had a dedicated workspace at home. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us more about that and, and why it's important? Uh, because what you are basically creating is, is a home base, right? So you have your home base that used to be your workspace and suddenly was taken uh -huh. away from you. So you need to create the same environment for your mental and, um, and well-being to actually be more productive and be more engaged. 
in all of the surveys that, uh, that what we have identified is that people are actually not engaged for the first three weeks of mm. enforced quarantine. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we are saying is get your people furnished. So companies, please facilitate get, getting just the very, the very basic. It could be a chair. It could be a lamp. Uh, also identify what are those tech tools that aren't working and which ones are working and also implement a well-being program. So right. prior to COVID-19, no many companies had, uh, they have work from home policies. However, in Asia, the lines were really blurry. If you look at Japan and Korea, uh, basically people had to be seen at, uh, at the workspace, even though there was uh, at least one or two days out of the week, they were able to be working from home. The same happened in China. So now when people are effectively forced to be working from home, you should be able to also complement not just with furnishing and tech tools, but also with a well-being program. So All people right. uh, keep engaged. All right, let me go to Fred Ayuzon, uh, who's already began this uh, uh, shift, supporting the shift to work from home uh, environments. Tell us about uh, how your business has adapted, Fred. I understand like you have big corporations now doing like what Google is doing, like kind of like subsidizing, supporting um, executives and managers at home by uh, providing furniture. Yeah, um, same with uh, Tatiana and the rest of the group. We, we at CWC uh, started a bit slow. Huh? We've been in the business for like almost 30 years. Uh, around five years in retail, uh, very strong in the contracts market uh, some, um, with all the multinationals and the BPO. Um, we figured that uh, this thing on is not, it's not gonna last long. No? So, but uh, as we see it coming and, 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 and the pandemic uh, situation is getting worse, we figured that we need to move on. We need to find a way to, to survive this, no? So, Fortunately, we have 2,000 Herman Miller chairs on inventory, and it became a perfect storm. We came up with a, with a flyer, uh, six flyers, and a campaign, um, a two-photo two contest campaign, which includes uh, the best photo uh, for the work from home and also the number of likes. So everything mushroomed, and uh, we started trending, and uh, we invaded the village marketplaces as well. It becomes... a uh, a uh, phenomenon uh, during this crisis was everybody's locked down 60, 90 days, everybody's doing nothing, small things matter. Now they have time for their hosts. So everybody's, you know, struggling to order chairs and, you know, and fortunately Herman Miller for the last five years has embarked on a work from home uh, program. You know, I mean, even if you go to Herman Miller, Michigan, we, People are working three days, four days, and they, they have this program uh, ahead. No? So we're also fortunate that branding really matters now. And we saw the, the power of branding through the build marketplaces. We set up our online programs, our online platform. So, you know, uh, we always say that in every end, there's an opportunity. In every crisis, you know, th there's something. You know? So for us, it's, it, we're just we're really fortunate. And to add to that, the corporate people, the people like our client, long-term clients like Globe Telecoms, Ernest, uh, uh, he also embarked with an HR to come up with a wellness program for their people because they work long hours in the house, more, more, more than in the office, without the traffic, yeah. without the parking. Eight hours is probably 12 hours mm -hmm. in the house. Right? So, uh, yeah, so we came up with a program. We were, uh, and the employees are enjoying their ergonomic furniture. What, whatever furniture they have in the home, they're now in, in the office, now they're enjoying it in their homes. So with proper wellness and proper, you know. So I think, you know, the, this is, uh, uh, CWC is uh, also lucky to have this, uh, you know, I mean, the inventory that they say, cash, in, cash is king, and uh, also the logistics and the manpower to really be able to deliver seven, eight trucks a day during these uh, pandemic times, no? So All right. Thank, okay. Thanks so much, Fred. I'll get back to you again uh, about uh, your, your programs. Okay. Uh, let me toss over to Victoria, because Fred mentioned wellness at home, um, which is quite a new concept, at least when it comes to work-related uh, stuff. So how, how, do you, how do you expect offices to shift the perks, the wellness perks, which are available in the office space, the gyms, uh, you had the... Uh, you had the, uh, the cafes, you had 
all these different things that, that were, in, were introduced and invested in to produce wellness in, in the office and shift that to the home, considering employees are now uh, decentralized? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I think some of it will be leveraging technology, which uh, we talked about before. So taking things online, the same way we've taken meetings online, taking fitness classes online, taking yoga online, um, maybe, I mean, I know a lot of people are uh, relying on delivery services at the moment. So again, even our shopping is going mm -hmm. somewhat online. Maybe we can use uh, the power of education and communication to get those messages through. So where people have already invested in um, some of these policies, like you said, or some of these initiatives in the office, looking at ways at which you can actually take them either online or offsite. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will start to get people feel like, oh, I'm being looked after even when I'm not in the office space. Mm -hmm. So whether that's being able to attend something by logging in online or whether, that, whether that's by being able to order something and still get corporate benefits or whether that is just having like something additional, like um, we talked earlier about mental health, mm -hmm. being able to have that um, new support so maybe it's new training being rolled out and then on the physical side like alex just said maybe it's having the the the, the chair that's actually comfortable more comfortable than the sofa which mm -hmm. makes you hunch or the kitchen bench which hurts your lower back um, so i do think there's lots of different ways you just have to be able to right the time if i, I yeah, Victoria, you go ahead. You're still in the middle of the sentence. No, I'm just going to say you just have to be able to prioritize what's going to be best for your employees. All right, uh, Tatiana. Um, yeah, exactly. The, the, as attractive as working from home has become, people feel safe. They're with their loved ones. They're in, in a comfortable area. Um, the work-life balance, which used to be very clear before, you worked <laughs> separately from the house. Yeah. It's now the boundaries have collapsed, right? The, the division yeah. has collapsed. You're, your, your children are in the same workspace. Um, you can't, you know, your roles as a father or as a husband or mother and spouse have now become intertwined with your, your being a, a manager employee. How do you manage that? So what we are saying is basically when, when companies are forcing or enforcing a work from home program, they should actually be implementing uh, key strategy plans. And what we say is basically dedicate do dedicate downtime so mm -hmm. the same as you do when you create a routine and this is something that should escalate from the company uh this this doesn't come from the employee naturally mm -hmm. so we should not be expecting ourselves as employees uh, to come up with these brilliant ideas this should come from hr so this should be tied into the hr policies so one thing that I wanted also to add to Victoria's point is uh, when we are losing having drinks, having coffee, something that we have started actually doing with, with uh, our team, which is the workplace and well-being team, we do online happy hours. So how are those, what are those policies that you can easily implement from the HR point of view uh, that you keep people engaged and you are not jumping on a, on a Zoom video conferencing uh, without a purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. So another thing that we're saying is um, do create a dedicated workspace, uh, create a dedicated, dedicated routine for work time, mm -hmm. and create a dedicated routine for downtime. All right. This is the okay. WARM, right? The acronym, the WARM acronym. That's, you, the, you... that's, the, that's the WARM thing. All right. All right. Uh, we have a lot of questions online, very interesting questions for all of you, but I'll just uh, maybe conclude my part with a question which I want all of you to answer, okay? Let's start with Victoria. I think what's happening here because of the recession, uh, the uncertainty in the economy, a lot of companies quite uh, logically are having to maybe, you know, reprioritize their expenses. And usually what is sacrificed is um, the office design, the office space or wellness programs. Um, should these be sacrificed, Victoria? I mean, what, and what would be the implications of that? Great question. And I think um, you get a different answer depending on who you ask. Yeah. Um, what I do think though, is I have a lot of conversations with companies whereby they understand the importance. And although I think everybody for the last couple, last couple of months has sort of been head down in the books, like bottom line focus. Um, and obviously from an economic standpoint, there are numbers that companies have to meet. And I don't think we can 
you know, we can't say ignore that. We can't say that's going to go away. I think that that has to be a priority for a business that, that, that needs to be profitable and needs to be able to pay people their salaries. However, for people to be productive and for people to be able to go out there and do their best work for the business in order to achieve the bottom line, well-being can't be sacrificed because if people are stressed out or if people are disengaged or if people don't care anymore because they don't feel like they're being looked after, that's going to be detrimental to the business. Right. The okay. same way that if they're injured because they've been, you know, um, sitting on the floor for months or whatever, uh, s silly example, but the same kind of thing. If people can't physically do the work, then also they're not going to be able to create those numbers for the business. So I do right. think it's a matter of keeping it as one of the, one of the priorities. Alex, you're probably hearing clients saying the same thing. It's like, you know, this is not a good time for investing in office equipment and office chairs on wellness programs. What do you have to say to that? Well, basically, I think um, in the short to the midterm, I think we definitely will see a shift in the workplace strategy. So I think work from home would definitely be the key concept uh, in many companies to adopt in the interim. But I think moving on, uh, basically, we will anticipate companies settling for a more sort of a balanced approach between physical and virtual solutions and also rethinking about, you know, the way the different approach on designing their workspace mm -hmm. uh, based on their long term needs. But what they would see is moving from forward. I think the new norm is definitely what we will anticipate then. Mm. All right. Fred, uh, how, how is CWC? communicating with um, these corporations, with companies about, um, you know, investing in what is necessary to keep their workers well, healthy, and happy? Um, we are coordinating closely with all the multinationals and BPOs and all the clients who yeah. form, form a, a wellness program, um, table, chairs, and the contracts are still coming in. And the BPO is still busy, Pogo is busy. So we're fine in their field. It's become an essential. Um, well, one thing I want to share is this pandemic uh, crisis has, has made us realize a lot of things. One, one is, uh, uh, it is we, are, we are using one channel now. It's it level, level playing field. So everybody mm -hmm. would be on the digital transformatory stage. No? So mm -hmm. the Philippines now can be uh, competing against the best of the world. You know, mm -hmm. so like um, we can, uh, CWC's dream has always been to come up with the first Filipino designed furniture that can, uh, you know, uh, that is globally sourced. Mm -hmm. So now with, with this digital highway, I think we will be able to be a part of uh, the world, no? of course, mm -hmm. um, uh, taking in consideration in partnership with Herman Miller and other uh, mm -hmm. global partners. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about time that the Filipino come up with their own uh, brand and their own design in conjunction with people like Herman Miller to, to, to profess the, uh, the way we do things and, and the way we design things. So right. um, uh, that's one. And second is family and environment. And these are the two things that made, made us understand better. Um, we spend more time with the, with the kids, with their wives, and we learn a lot of uh, hobbies. Uh, you know, I learned how to cook again, and uh, piano, mm -hmm. and the DJ, and so on. I think uh, it's more benefit than uh, this benefits to this pandemic. So it's 90 days in lockdown. It should be an opportunity for all, all of us to, to, to share. And I, I think the new normal is going to stay. We're not going back to the old normal. All right, Tatiana, per perfect uh, point to make from Fred there. This could be forever. This is not a temporary emergency button we're pressing just because there's a pandemic. I think uh, the workplace will, will change uh, in a more significant way. So going back to my question about investment, how do you future-proof your investment in wellness and in, in office design? So one thing that we have identified is that when a company doesn't have a, a structured well-being program, you can see the side effects on productivity and engagement. And mm -hmm. how do you see that, the, 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 the instant thing, uh, mm -hmm. and the way how you, you see it at first is with sick days. So uh, when you don't have a proper well-being policy and engagement, people tend to take sick days uh, more, more than usual, more than normal. Mm -hmm. So it is an investment that companies should actually revise and how much cash they're actually um, investing and burning 
when people are taking so many sick days uh, mm -hmm. per month or per mm -hmm. year and, mm -hmm. and how you can actually benefit from having a invest the same amount of money or maybe less mm -hmm. uh, and combat uh, mm -hmm. those things with a well-being program. So what we've seen here and, and one thing that we, we've been working on behind the scenes uh, with our research team in, in Michigan is um, what, formulating what is the, the future of work and what we have identified is that there will be many scenarios and there will be many scenarios based on our location, based on our cultural differences. Because it's not the same to have a, an office in the Philippines than having an office in Japan, even mm -hmm. we are in the same region or having an office in India. So some of the stats that we got from Europe are very different. So people here actually um, are very stressed because they are all locked at home with their relatives. However, what we've seen in the stats in Europe is that most of people live on their own. So there's a different stress. So we are working on different scenarios based on location. So that, that's one of the things that we always say is that no one size fits all. And we should work towards an intentional transition um, for the future of the workspace. All right. Stay on your Herman Miller chairs, everyone. Tatiana, Victoria, Fred, Alex, because... Um, it's our time now to introduce the questions from our audience. And we have quite a lot. So I'm told by Thea that we'll give an extra 15 to 20 more minutes to, to accommodate the many questions that have come in. I have like almost more than 30 here, actually, apart from those that have been sent in earlier. So let me just prioritize those that have been sent earlier. Um, OK, so here goes. Uh, in no particular order, Alex, Fred. According to Stephanie Carpio from Architectural Apprentice, she's an architectural apprentice rather, at Leander Luxin Partners. Um, interested to see different transient, flexible and more permanent setups that might be required. Wondering how much we need to future-proof our spaces now that the health crisis like these are on the table. We kind of touched on that, but let, let's get into that a bit more. Um, I think this is more specific about design, furniture design. So um, Tatiana, please. Okay. Yeah, so one, one thing that we, um, uh, part of the reason why we have shared the videos of Cosm chair is because it's a very light chair. It's a chair that basically accommodates to different environments. And it's a chair that uh, has gotten a, an award last year. So we are actually at Herman Miller looking at different products of not just chairs, but also ancillary. When we talk about ancillary, we talk about partitions, uh, we, we talk about screens and we're actually um, having and bringing a new line of furniture, uh, which is more uh, a home, if you wish to call it uh, home base or home settings uh, from the office uh, to yeah. our more um, yeah. hospitality and home environment. So that's what we are, are working with Herman Miller. So it's not just an emphasis on office furnishing, but also on home furnishing. Okay, um, sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. I think we're out of time, but maybe we have a few more questions. You know what, guys, those, those of you who are, I can't see you, but uh, I hope, uh, just to assure you, we have around 40 questions that, that have come in. Um, we will do our best to answer these questions um, through text, send them back to you. We'll be asking our speakers to maybe go through those questions and give short answers to those questions. But as far as this webinar is concerned, I think we promised just an hour and a half and we're a bit over time. So we'll, we'll try to keep it short. Maybe one more question. Um, um, Thea, any suggestions? There's just too many. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's right. Um, I think there's a good question here. Uh, hold on. Um, because we're, we're going to go to our closing uh, and, of course, the raffle yes. in a short while. But yeah. just to make everyone happy, let's have one question that, that has been sent in. Thea, it's a raffle of sorts. Raffle out the, the next question. Okay. So um, here, it, this is very interesting. It was, this is by uh, Jose Ernesto Baisic. Um, mm -hmm. It was mentioned that space efficiency can be at 50% utilized post-COVID. Is that what we see as the best or most optimal utilization at this time? Victoria, maybe you can answer that. I think Victoria froze. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great question. Let me just check I got it right. So, uh, <laughs> hello? <laughs> yeah. 
you're, you're, you're frozen guess, like yeah like, like the movie I, but uh but go ahead we can hear you you can hear me yes we yeah, can hear you. yes we can hear you it's just your video that froze Oh, I think we okay, well, I hope I don't look too ridiculous. Um, I just want to double check uh, that I got it right. So the, the question is regarding 50%, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. 50% of space efficiency is utilized okay. post COVID. I think, yeah, so I think the, the percentages remain to be seen. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of assumptions and a lot of real estate, estate companies are making assumptions. We're working on a... Um, on a space calculator that allows us to start to work out what will we need post COVID. I think the 50% stems from the fact that maybe you're maybe with regards to social distancing, you might need a bigger distance between people and therefore um, less people can be in. So actually you need to, you can also uh, reduce the space. Uh, my personal take on it is that um, there is going to be a need for more space for social distancing. There's less space because people are going to work from home, which, and you'll end up with a sort of status quo. What you'll then have to do is, going back to the scenarios I talked about earlier, is which scenario is your company going to take? What's most appropriate for your business? And if it is that the, a lot of people are going to work from home and you're going to have fewer people in the office, then yes, downsizing is an option. However, if you still want to have a 50-50 split, with social distancing, or if you still want to have fixed desk, uh, because that's already what you're operating on and you don't have any intention to move to on a 50%, because eventually, whether it's one, two, three years down the line, you're going to be out of space and you're going to have to move again, which doesn't make, sp doesn't make sense. So I think really the 50% is a, you have to look at their strategy. In in relation to their business and their business goals in the next five or so years to figure out what will be the best space use for them. And for some companies, a, a big reduction. All right. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I guess that's all the time we have, but don't worry. I was going through the questions while Victoria was, was, was answering. And I think we've covered, you have different questions uh, mm -hmm. phrased differently, but I think all the answers given by Fred, Alex, Victoria, Tatiana, uh, pretty much covered all the bases already. But, but if you insist on getting answers from them, uh, we'll have a team uh, of uh, Holders International uh, send these questions to our speakers and maybe they can answer you as well. So let's move on to our closing. But first, let's thank Tatiana Gomez, Victoria Gilbert, Frederick Yuson, and Alex Say for joining us. Let's clap. We can't hear the clap, the applause, but let's clap for ourselves. Mind <laughs> us. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, helping us navigate the new normal. It, it's quite uncertain. It's always good to have clear voices and ideas such as yours to help us feel a bit better about what to expect in the future. But now we've come to the end of our webinar, and this is the part of our viewers where they're going to get really excited because we're going to announce the winner of the raffle for the Aaron Remastered Chair, courtesy of CWC and Tears. That's Fred Usen over there. Thanks, Fred. But first, to give our closing remarks and announce the winner, I'd like to call on the Director for Tenant Representation at Colliers International Philippines, my good friend now because I've talked to him quite a number of times on Zoom, Dom Frederick Andaya. Dom, go ahead. Thank you, David. I know I'm standing between you and the Aaron Remastered Chair, so I'll make this quick. <laughs> anyway, good afternoon. Even before the lockdown, I said fighting COVID-19 is not only about face masks and alcohol we must respond with concrete initiatives around protecting our employees and the business, improving liquidity and intensifying client engagement for us to survive this challenge. Colliers International Philippines is one with the nation and the world in doing what is right for our people, clients and communities in fighting COVID-19 and its impacts to the economy. When this is over, it will not be business as usual. We have seen significant changes in how we will rebound and evolve when this pandemic is over. While we are going through this, Colliers intended to share meaningful insights because the bigger concerns for us and to me personally is for us to be paralyzed. Hence the reason why we came up with the, the new normal in commercial real estate, 
with six well-received articles which even caught the interest of the media and posted by Inquirer Property on its Facebook page. Our Q1 2020 property market report helped our clients make sense of what is going on. We need to keep playing the game, which will put us in a better position to rebound sooner rather than later. In one of the articles we wrote, Decision-Making in Times of COVID-19, we shared that we are in a VUCA world. It is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Nonetheless, decisions must be taken or else we might find ourselves in a more difficult situation. I like what Tatiana said a while ago, do not rush into making changes drastically. Observe, look at the data, and be more discerning. Some pieces of advice, know where you stand today and start with what resources and means you have. The future is unpredictable. Information may never be complete today we may never know the full picture, so know what you are comfortable of losing. Take incremental decisions and move forward. The year 2020 has been full of surprises and it continues to be a VUCA world daily. But as the saying goes, when life throws you lemons, make lemonade. Work together with partners who are willing to cooperate and commit to the goal moving forward. And lastly, you are the pilot of your plane. The future depends on the choices that you make. This Life Spaces, the Future of the Workplace webinar series, take note, this is a series, um, is meant to share knowledge and insights to our partners so they too can embrace and adapt to this new normal. As early as two years ago, we have started talking about wellness in the workplace without knowing that a pandemic like COVID-19 is there to disrupt us. Wellness in the workplace was seen at that time as a cost, but this pandemic magnified that workplace health and wellness should be a top priority of companies, which should become a competitive, which could become a competitive advantage. I hope we were able to accomplish that today. At this juncture, I want to thank Victoria Gilbert, Tatiana Gomez for sharing their valuable time and insights today. The participation of Fred Yuson and Alex Say gave more meaning to the meaningful conversation, so thank you as well. And then the seamless facilitation of David gave this webinar the much needed energy and positivity that we all need. Thank you, David. And lastly, I want to recognize the core team from Colliers International, CWC Interiors, and Herman Miller, who all worked very hard to make this event successful. We are looking forward to have meaningful conversations in the next parts of this Life Spaces webinar series and our upcoming data and knowledge-driven articles. Please reach out to us should you feel we could be of help, as we are always glad to have meaningful conversations with you. We will get out of this stronger together. Yeah, it's not over yet. The, the <laughs> raffle of the Aaron Remastered Chair is next. Um, so Thea, please come back. Hello, guys. Hi. Okay, so uh, everybody's excited, I guess, to see who will win the, the chair. So let me uh, share my screen. So here we are. Uh, all the names are in. And... Um, if you win the chair, so this is for the attendees, if you are chosen by this magic wheel as the winner, please chat, uh, send us a message in the chat so that we know you are a present during the event because you have to be present to win this chair. Okay, are we ready for our first spin? Let's go. Okay, spinning. The anticipation is. <laughs> that is the actual Aaron chair that you see on yes. screen. Yeah. Yes, that is the Aaron chair. Okay, we have. Who is it? Francis Kim de Guzman, are you here? Send us a chat if you are. Um, other teammates are also checking if she is. She is here. I think this is a she. Oh, she's not. Oh. oh, he's not. Okay, Ouch. I don't see her. <laughs> Too bad. Okay, another spin. <laughs> Sorry, Francis. <laughs> Maybe she just went to the toilet or... Well, I... Well, yeah, <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah, you had to be here. That was clear. <laughs> you you had, had to be here. You had to be in front of the screen, yeah. Yes. 
Okay, next winner. Hope he's hope the person is here. Marco. He's here. Hi, Marco. Can you send us a message? Okay. Oh. He's here. Congratulations, Marco. How do we um, know it's you, Marco, and not, not someone else? I'm yeah. no, just kidding. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Congrats. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations to a uh, new chair. <laughs> okay, so that's the winner. I will get in touch with uh, Marco, um, our our organizing team, and CWC uh, to send up the chair. All right. Thank you so much, Thea, and congratulations to Marco. Enjoy that Adrian remastered chair. Don't forget, uh, Fred has his uh, promotion continuing. There's a photo contest. Uh, if you have any Herman Miller chair at home, whether it's that new Aaron remaster or we have more than 500 online right now, if you have a Herman Miller chair at home, photograph uh, that chair in, in its work, work from home environment and get a chance to win another Aaron remastered chair. <laughs> so thanks so much, Fred, for the generosity and for your time. Thanks so much to Alex uh, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, Victoria and Tatiana. Dom, thank you as, as, as always for, for hosting uh, this program for us. And to all of you, we hope we take this opportunity to take a look at the uncertainty and look at the flip side, find a positive thing to it and plan ahead, think clearly. Uh, and best of all, make sure that we're all safe and sound and healthy because wellness is what's really important in this age. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye to all of you. Hope to see you for the next series of our uh, of our Colliers International webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.